Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, we're just going to wait a minute or two to allow everyone to log in and uh, then we'll get started with our Live with Digital Transitions uh, feature of Michael Furman. If in the chat window you could uh, type where you're from, it'd be great. I have to go like this to see my uh, <laughs> for my variable focal lenses. Uh, I look like my father with his bifocals. Okay, <laughs> how do I get that to come down lower? Pennsylvania, we got Delaware, California, Netherlands. It's great. You got quite the following, Michael. From the Netherlands, no less. Oh, yeah, man. Canada, Maryland. This is great. Well, some of these are names I actually recognize. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so I guess we'll get started here. I'm Lance Shad from uh, Digital Transitions, and to my right on my screen is Michael Furman, who will be our featured presenter. I'm just going to go over a little bit about um, who Digital Transitions is and uh, who will be involved today in our session, and then a little bit of background on Michael, and then we're going to let him take off with his presentation. Well, first of all, as you can see, the presenter and hosts, we have Michael Furman, who is our featured guest, it's myself. Right there, we have Arnab, Ch Arn Arnab Chatterjee, who is our product manager, who will be monitoring the chat and helping with some of our technical questions. And then we have Carson Boykin, who's uh, here from our marketing team, who has uh, pulled this all together. And thank you, Carson. Excellent job so far. Um, Digital Transitions, we're uh, a company that's built uh, up around three different business units. We have our DT Photo Division, which is you know, geared towards regular photographic type of systems uh, based around medium format, uh, with phase one being the predominant brand that we represent and have been representing for the past um, close to 17, 18 years. Um, we have uh, more information on our website about DT Photo. Um, you can do sales, service, and rentals from us. Then we also have our heritage division where we work with all the major museums, libraries, institutions, um, corporate archives in digitizing uh, their collections to allow them to be um, used in a variety of ways. And um, we work with all the major institutions out there, such as the Getty, New York Public Library, Library of Congress, to name a few. Um, and then Pixel Acuity uh, is a service bureau that um, uses all of our equipment um, to provide services for those institutions and corporate archives. So um, those are our three main business units that you could uh, find out more online and, or talk to your rep. Um, we have three different locations, physical locations. We have our main headquarters in New York City, um, Pixel Acuity and DT in uh, Washington DC metro area, and then also in Southern California in Los Angeles. Um, we can connect with us uh, via a variety of different ways online, uh, via our web pages or social media, which are listed here. Uh, we also have a, um, a link you can click within the presentation to learn more. And then uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. If you have any questions uh, that you'd like answered, you can uh, type them in on your screen on the right hand side. And what we're going to do is going to put them all together and uh, answer them at the end of the presentation. So uh, don't worry, we have you, and we'll ask, ask those questions to get those answers towards the end. Now, Michael. Michael you know, has been a professional photographer since the early 70s. His work has consists of a variety of different commercial types of assignments, as well as automotive, of which mostly we'll be talking about his automotive work today. Um, he has been an early adopter, adopter of digital imaging since the early days. Um, as a beta tester for Agfa and Kodak on their digital imaging systems before even Photoshop came out. 
you know, he was doing uh, digital retouching and manipulation and compositing digitally back in the days when he was shooting film. And then um, I met Michael when he wanted to test out the phase one systems back in, I think it was 2001. He said, you know, Lance, I want to test out this phase one system. Come meet me at this airplane hangar. I'm like, okay. I get to this hangar. There's a huge helicopter. And I'm like, oh, you're going to shoot that? And he's like, yes. So he explained his process of using the digital back or his idea of using the digital back on the back of his Cinar camera and doing all these multiple exposures and then compositing it on a computer afterwards. I was like, oh my God, that sounds amazing. Can't wait to see the final results. Good luck. Well, what's it, 20 years later? You know, we're here now. We're going to be talking about his body of work since then. And uh, he's had about four different models of the phase one back since we first met in the year 2001. And now he's currently shooting with the IQ4 150 on the XF body, which is our flagship model. Um, so he also has a publishing company called Coach Milk Press, where he publishes his own books uh, in conjunction with um, Brilliant Studios and um, printing them there here in Pennsylvania, which he'll touch on as well. And um, without further ado, I'm going to let Michael take over the presentation because it's a very lengthy one and uh, very it'll be very cool. Well, enjoy. And here's Michael. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining me. And Lance and the crew here at DT. Um, I was asked to participate because what I do is a little bit different than what most photographers do. And my the path of my career has been somewhat really different than uh, any photographer I'm aware of. But I got into photography when I was very young. And as much as I enjoyed playing with cameras, it was really lighting that kind of uh, got me started. And uh, I went to college up at RIT. And if you've been to Rochester, it's not known for its wonderful weather. And I didn't have a car. And I had nothing better to do except work in the studio. And at that point, I just really worked hard working on my lighting, such that when I graduated, I immediately opened my own studio in Philadelphia. I figured, why not? I don't know anybody. I don't know um, any place to turn. So I figured, ah, I'll, I'll just I'll just get started here. And what was good about that is I already had a very strong uh, background in studio lighting. And at the time, and this is in 1974, um, there weren't many people graduating college with a degree in photography, let alone having any experience lighting anything. So that's how I began. It was sort of happenstance that I was um, a studio still life photographer. I really wanted to be a photographer, a photojournalist that changed the world. And my photojournalism teacher at RIT explained to me that I really wasn't very good at it. And uh, which was a relief to me because I kept trying to force myself into that, into that arena and it just wasn't working. But he did say something. He said, you know, I think you've got something there, but it, it, it's just not photojournalism. And many years later, maybe 40 years later, uh, I sent him a note and I thanked him for that best piece of advice I ever had. And that is, I wasn't really very good at something. And imagine up until then, I was the only guy with a camera. So everybody loved the pictures, even though they may have been awful. And... Uh, so a little bit of reality was the best thing that I could have heard. And, um, and I'm happy where I wound up. I didn't get to change the world the way I wanted to, but instead I kind of slipped into an area where I'm able to uh, impact a specific niche and I'm very involved in it. So as I say, I started out life as a, um, let me see. Okay, I'm already messing this up here. I started out life as a, there's a, there's a window that's sitting on top of the control. Yeah, just line close that window. Uh, I think there's a few dots at the top. Uh, the pop-up. 
Uh, do I want to delete um, that action? Carson. We didn't have this in our. There you go. Thank you. Go you. Ahead, delete it and then use your keyboard keys to advance them forward. Right. I'm good. I'm good after that. Okay. So, as I said, the first things I were doing were small things in the studio that I could manage and control. And what really separates a photographer from just about anybody else is the extreme reliance on light. And I've said this many times, but when you go to take a photograph, you don't need a camera, you don't need film, you don't need lenses, you don't need anything except light. And as a second aspect of that, it would be a good idea if you had an idea in mind as to what you were doing. Although ideas are not a prerequisite for any of this stuff. But so that's how I started. And um, next thing you know, I'm getting all these different car uh, assignments shooting in the studio, all these different still life things for different people. And um, and I always took it as a lighting challenge to see what I was doing and how to do it. And uh, which set me up beautifully for when it came time to shoot cars. Um, I already had the experience of shooting things that were uh, reflective and metal, things that are very challenging and are very, very uh, indicative of car photography. So generally, if you could shoot small reflective things in the studio, you could shoot, uh, you could shoot cars. Uh, a lot of people found that very challenging to shoot small chrome objects, jewelry, things of that nature. But I, I didn't have any problem with it at all. I enjoyed it very much. And it really set me up for being a car photographer. I guess it was the late 90s I decided that I was going to get more into shooting cars and then eventually doing some books and my career took a bit of a sideways turn and um, so I did my first books in the early 2000s and I did not like the way things were being reproduced so I went in and decided I was going to publish my own books at about that time uh, I was shooting in Detroit and I was shooting film and I needed to get my film processed and the assistants at the studio there advised me that the lab that I would normally use was no longer in business because everyone was shooting digitally. And I had been exploring digital capture up until that point. I had, I had consulted with uh, Kodak and Agfa and it's not that I'm any great whiz. I figured that they picked me because they figured if, if Furman can do this, anybody can do this. So that's how they picked me. And yet and I was not a product out there that was good enough to use to shoot cars with. And when I was in Detroit, it was, it was told to me that uh, phase one has a digital back that is the best thing out there. And I came right back to Philadelphia and I got involved with it, as you heard earlier, with Lance and phase one. This picture of a Lalique uh, mascot or hood ornament is one of the first handful of photographs I took back then. I had no idea what I was doing with the digital capture, capture and I had to kind of teach myself a lot of things. Uh, but the picture is here all these years later, and it's still a wonderful photograph of a great subject. I consider what I do portraiture as opposed to product work. And my inspiration for what I do comes from the great uh, uh, portrait photographers and uh, artists. And I have no idea how anybody else shoots a car. I've never seen anybody do it. I've never assisted for anybody. So when I come to the table, I'm coming with my own philosophy, my own point of view. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm there to create a portrait of my subject. And what I like about the great portrait photographers like Richard Avedon, uh, this picture here of Marilyn Monroe, for example, and this next picture of uh, Ezra Pound, who um, was photographed by Irving Penn, 
what they taught me was you let the subject matter dictate the photograph. Um, you don't force anything on the subject matter. These two gentlemen were masters of allowing the subject to express itself. And it's always been my philosophy that if I can do that in my car photography, that um, that's where I want to be. So it seemed like the best thing to do in the studio. I don't take the cars outside, generally speaking. And um, when you go outside, you have to deal with backgrounds and things like that. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to have pictures like these that really spoke uh, about the subject. And then, of course, you have the great lighting that takes place in the Renaissance artists like Vermeer and uh, Rembrandt where they use chiaroscuro, which is the playing of light against dark to reveal things, which is how I like stuff. And uh, so that's where my inspiration comes from. These are two of the book titles that we've done in recent years. Um, the image on the left is the hood ornament to a Stutz and on the right is what's called an accessory ornament or one that you would buy in a catalog, a catalog and put it on your car. So if that is in fact the case, the hood ornament from Stutz is really how Stutz feels about themselves and their customers. Whereas when you put your own ornament on a car, it speaks more to how you feel about yourself and how you want to be perceived. Until I went to do this project, I didn't know any of that. Uh, it was explained to me that that is how it's done. And uh, let's see, I'm having a little trouble with my mouse here. Give me a second. So for me, that lighting is very important. That chiaroscuro lighting is very important, controlling the light to get the viewer to see what I want them to see and allowing things to go darker and reveal themselves maybe very subtly in the shadows. If you look in the shadow area in the lower left side of this photograph, you can start to see the spokes on the spare tire on this uh, spare wheel. And in the lower right, you see the tread of the tire peeking out under the fender. And where this gets interesting is trying to hold the detail in the Alfa Romeo script that's in Chrome. Um, all this gets very, very involved. And digital capture was the way to solve most of this. This is the steering wheel of a Bugatti from 1936. And again, as I was used to shooting things close up in details of things, this was all very second nature to me. And when I shot the first time in Detroit, all of my assistants who I had picked up in Detroit had way more experience than I did. And um, the way I was using the equipment, the way I was approaching everything, they kind of looked at me funny because they'd never seen anybody shoot the way I do. And... Um, Yet the pictures came out and uh, you know, nobody yelled at me. But what makes a car much more difficult than a lot of subjects is not only are they highly reflective, but they also have different facets. If you see the front of this Mercedes, you see the, the, um, the grill shape is going in different directions, which means it has different lighting requirements. Then you add on top of that the curvature of the chrome housing of the lamps. All this creates layers and layers of difficulty. And if you're shooting a normal subject, and I mean normal like a non-highly reflective subject, you can just put a fill card in there. Or you can turn on another light or something of that nature. But when you're shooting a car, you can't do that. Because if I put a fill card in this photograph, you'd see the shape of that car reflected not only in every reflective surface, but you'd see it then reflecting back down into the paint and then back up into the reflective surface. So that one fill card may appear 20 times in this photograph. 
And the only way to get around that is really to use the tools in Capture One where you can open up shadows and you can do things like that. If I was shooting this on film, I would have been out of luck. The equipment itself is, is highly specialized. Um, the light bank itself that we shoot with is a single light source, but it has 10 different strobe heads in it. So we can put out 30, 32,000 watt seconds of light, which is a fair amount. That light bank is about 50 feet wide and about nine feet deep. And the camera in the foreground is how we used to shoot. And that is with a Cinar. And FaZe at the time had a digital back that fit onto a view camera. And that digital back allowed you to slide the window that you were shooting into around on the digital back so you could get multiple captures and therefore the file would be much bigger. Um, we eventually learned that doing a single capture on an optimized lens, like the uh, initially the digital lenses on the Hasselblad, and then as I switched to phase, the phase lenses were way, 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 way sharper than a view camera lens, which was never designed to be used digitally. And that camera is about 60 or 70 feet away from the the uh, red car and the shooting space is 80 by 200 feet with a 40 foot ceiling. And here's the set when I'm actually working at it more closely to give you an idea of how big this space is. And that is the car that we photographed. Now, not only do cars have, have um, highly reflective surfaces, but they have large areas that are smooth gradients. And as such, they are prone to have all kinds of problems. First of all, you can probably see me reflecting in. So I've got to get far enough away that I can be covered in black so that you don't see me. And the other thing is as the software improves over the years, we have taken files and gone back into the software and reprocessed the images because the software is so much improved. This image was not usable when we originally took it. Uh, the gradation wasn't smooth enough. It was all choppy. And so when we did this, this was part of a book for Ralph Lauren. When we did this, we couldn't use the shot. But a number of years later, as FaZe kept improving the Capture One software, we were able to use it and I've since made very large prints of this and it's worked out quite nicely. There's a side benefit for shooting digitally that most people don't realize. And that is while you're shooting and if something's reflective, you've got to control everything that's going on and you have all these reflector cards and things like that to properly light up the mascot on this Model T Ford. Well, in order to rig all that stuff so it stays in place is a lot of effort. You have to use stands and clamps and claws and make sure none of that stuff reflects into what you're shooting. But by shooting digitally, my assistants can hand hold this stuff. I'm looking through the camera and I'm advising them as to where they need to be. And as soon as it looks good to me, I click the shutter. So the simple act of shooting has become uh, more efficient, more accurate, and allows me to get the best portrait of my subject that I can. And then sometimes we're looking down from very high angles and I don't like that. So by being able to shoot from the camera or by, from the computer while the camera is suspended in the air is, is very, very helpful to me. Now, once you go to do some of these things, there's lots of reasons why pictures look the way they do. And unlike a lot of photographs where there's a lot, a lot of subject matter rather, where there's room for uh, subjective approach, you can decide to do this, you can decide to do that, you can light it differently and things of that nature. When you're using, you're shooting cars, you don't have quite the same luxury. This is the exact same car shot from two different people. 
and uh, the one on the top is mine, and the one on the bottom is a photographer who I compete with on projects all the time. And I'm not real crazy about blowing my own horn, but I can't believe that people couldn't see the difference between these two shots. The one on the top looks way more interesting, and the one on the bottom is is the way it is because of the reflect the restrictions and how this photographer shoots. Here's the same combination of photographers. My work is on the left and his work is on the right. And either you get the shot right or you don't. Now the shot on the right is fairly interesting. I'm not denying that. But I think when you compare it to the shot on the left, it doesn't hold up. Also the car on the right is now nowhere near that color. The color on the left is accurate, which is very important. A lot of what we do are for museums, uh, museum exhibitions, uh, be they fine art museums or automotive museums. We did all the work for Ralph Lauren on his cars when they appeared at the MFA in Boston. And we also did it when the cars appeared at the Louvre. And when someone has three or four Ferraris and they're all slightly different colors, you want to make sure that they reproduce as slightly different colors. And you want to make sure you're as accurate as you can be. Um, Again, by working digitally, we can zoom in on the uh, on the monitor and really check what we're doing from focus to uh, reflections and things of that nature. Now, when I first started shooting digitally, I wasn't always shooting cars. I was shooting other subject matter. And of course, like most photographers, I got enamored with this new reality that one could create. And um, not every picture, not every idea behind the picture can tolerate such uh, heavy special effects. And I know I look at a picture like this and the first thing I see is the special effect. What the client was talking about, which was a chemical company, but how their products are used to help people all around the world. And um, this was a very interesting project to do. And it required a lot of technical skill on our part to pull it off. Um, but I quickly realized that this is not always the best way of doing things with your digital capability. And if the only reason to exist is a special effect, you've got to try a little harder to get past that to get to an image that has some substance behind it. And this was an early image we did on the Barco system that allowed us to texture map uh, all these gears and everything on this woman's face. And back then, we didn't have layers. So it meant when you put something down, are you seeing my, um, my cursor? Okay. Well, if you look at her forehead, when you place some of those gears down, they don't move. Of course, in today's world, you can slide everything around. Everything's a different layer and you can do all this stuff. But back then, once you put it down, you were taking your best guess. And unless you wanted to start the whole procedure all over again, um, you were in trouble. Also back then, files were like 20 megabytes. So there's only so much screwing around you could do with this stuff, as opposed to today when our files get into gigabyte size. And even something as simple as this, um, that's an extraordinary amount of work because the first blush is to take um, the sutures and actually stick these two different apples together. And you cannot do it cleanly enough, no matter how hard you try. So either you have to have a prop made for a lot of money or digitally you go and put all this together. In today's world, this would be easier to do with the technology that exists. But for me, the best use of the technology was to photograph reality and to create things that you could not otherwise um, 
capture in a single capture. You may recall that the light bank is roughly 10 by 48 feet or something like that. This helicopter is more than 50 feet long and the blades extend out in, in two different directions. They go side to side and front to back. The blades themselves have to be 80 feet long. So no way did any of this stuff fit underneath the light bank. So what we decided to do was to shoot everything in pieces. So we set up the camera and shot from further away with a longer lens and we shot everything we could in pieces. And this was 18 separate captures that were then stitched together. And because you're shooting digitally, all the exposures will match. And you can tell that they will match because if you're shooting film, of course, uh, the variation in your aperture would, would have messed the whole thing up. Also, you had the problem that the rotor itself on the top reflected back down into the helicopter body. So it's reflecting into the helicopter. You can't have it reflect in one part of the helicopter and that reflection not to continue where else it belonged. So this was a real challenge to do it. It took about 12 hours and fortunately, nobody bumped into the camera. Here's another sample of blending images to improve reality. If I'm not mistaken, this truck was not shot in this gravel pit. It was shot earlier in the day somewhere else because we couldn't get light down into this pit. This is a huge pit outside of Atlanta that it took, I don't know, 25 minutes to drive down to get to the surface and the light was just changing too fast. So we shot the two things separately and put them together digitally. The same thing holds true for this next image. But in this case, these two images were shot a few days apart and a couple of states apart. I think the vehicle was shot in Florida and the background was shot in Georgia. And that is a cement pumper. And if you don't know what it is, you're, you're part of the vast majority because I had no idea what it was. Now, here's, here's one that is a little bit simpler to understand. This is two photographs. And it started out life as one photograph with the two cars sitting in position to themselves. But it was so bright outside that it couldn't be handled in one capture. So the two cars were put in position I exposed first for the car inside on the left, and then I reshot the second exposure for the car outside, and I darkened the exposure down so it would reproduce. In the interim, the reflection of the car outside is still reflected in the foreground. So this is as real as you're going to get, yet it's two shots that were done separately. Sometimes when we shoot vehicles, we can't take them where we want to take them. This was shot in California for a museum outside of San Francisco. And this car was shot near the museum and the background was shot about an hour away a few days later. And the most difficult part of a shot like this is how to marry the two pictures together. And that always means the shadow. And the shadow is the thing that gives everything away. And um, so it didn't take a lot of effort to put the car in the background, but it takes an enormous amount of effort to get the shadow to look believable. I still occasionally shoot for clients that are not um, automobiles. And that started when I was shooting watches for Ralph Lauren. I had shot his cars and he said, can you shoot my watches? I said, oh, I love to shoot watches. And that got shown to the people at Bulova and they had me photograph their new patented design where the entire watch is curved. So not just the face, but the whole body of the watch is curved and the movement inside. 
And they really didn't know quite how they were going to do it. And that's where this whole, all this technology really worked out beautifully. I brought my digital artist, who I keep on staff, I brought him to New York with me. We rented a studio. And I thought it best that he put these images together while the client was there. The client had no layouts. They had no idea what they wanted to do. And they kind of sat there and looked at me like, I'm going to do this. So this is the idea that I came up with as if we were looking at phases of the moon. And what was so wonderful about this, the very first exposure we did was the one on the left. And it looked very much like what you see there. It was really, really close, which doesn't always happen. And the client was thrilled. And they were like dancing and I'm like, geez, you people are crazy. This is just a first capture. Anyway, everything we did that way, that day happened to go right. And when they left, my artist said to me, are all shoots like this? Do they all go this easy where everybody's like thrilled and wants to hug you and everything? I said, in all my years, this is the first time this has happened and probably the only time it will ever happen. And so far, yes, it has been, it's the only time it's ever happened. So my question to the audience is this, is this a straight photograph? This is a real live, honest to God, living and breathing bunny rabbit sitting in a thicket of wildflowers. Does anybody want to tell me how this was done? Well, that's going over well. <laughs> Nobody wants to chat about it. Let me see. Let me scroll Someone's used, used carrots to keep them still. Okay, there you are. Uh, practical effect, no digital, no, sedated rabbit. Time. All right, you can tell us. <laughs> that is a real live, honest to God rabbit we stuck in a thicket of flowers that we had set up in the studio with an 8x10 camera. And we, we took the shot. Absolutely straight shot, no retouching. So in today's world where I get a little frustrated is when you can pull off a shot like this that was miraculous and that we were able to do it and the rabbit didn't jump out of the set and the camera didn't get knocked over and all that sort of stuff. Everyone thinks, oh, you did it digitally. So no one has an appreciation for what reality is anymore. So every so often, you try to use as much reality as you can, use as few um, digital techniques as you need to get the job done. Uh, now I show this because when you're shooting a car, it's very easy for highlights to get blown out. It's very easy for the shadows to get too dark. And when you're shooting film, we didn't have the ability to lighten up the dark areas. This is basically a straight shot, except for some of the chrome work that is on the car. When I go to shoot a car, I light for the paint. The very first thing I do is light for the paint. And everyone wonders why it looks so believable. And that's because we do not retouch the paint. I don't want to put a fill card in on the front of the car and see that fill card reflected in the paint so that I have to retouch it out. Instead, I will shoot for the paint. Then I will come back in with a fill card and light up the chrome on the front of the car. And then what we'll do, because the camera hasn't moved, my digital artist will blend the two images together. So we're constantly putting um, good elements together we are not removing problems so what i'm doing is an additive process it is not a subjective process where we're removing problems also i if you didn't notice earlier we're shooting the car on a platform and that allows us to spin the car without having to to drive it around and in doing so we can put things on the floor in front of the car on the platform to light up chrome details at the very bottom of the shot. So as reflective as most cars are, occasionally you're lucky enough to get Jerry Seinfeld's 1950 Porsche 
356 Gamun Coupe. It's the 50th car made by Porsche. And the car was never painted and it's an aluminum body. So the car is kind of weathered looking. So it's not terribly reflective. So this is one of the few times that I could come in there with fill cards if I wanted to, to lighten up certain aspects of the shot. And you would not see separate reflections of the fill cards. But I can count on one hand using just one finger for all the times that that happened. And this is the shot and this is the car. Also, the software is as a book publisher, the software really allows me to properly manage what I'm doing so that I can create spreads in the books that compare and contrast different cars. Um, I don't recall which book this came from, but the two cars on the top are French cars and the bottom left is a Cadillac and the bottom left is a Buick and all these cars are pre-1910. And it's very interesting to see in that era how similar the cars can be or how different the cars could be considering there was no actual template for how to shoot a car or how to design a car, really. So this made it very, very easy for us to um, use the equipment to get where we need to go. Here's a situation up next where this is the same car pre-restoration and post-restoration. The image on the top was done at least five years before the image on the bottom. Both images were done in California in the same facility, but they were done, as I say, five years apart and the equipment came apart. I believe there are two different digital backs were used. So what we, and of course the phase software changed. So we went back in and we ran both the original captures through the current phase software and we were able to get the cars really lined up so they look so similar. And it really gives you an indication of the control that you have on something like this. So this is the kind of stuff that really helps me as a book publisher. And here's something similar. These cars were shot three or four years apart. But I sometimes use the whole setup to allow me to explore the lighting on the subject. And I'll see an interesting car like this and I'm not quite sure how to light it. And you can Im imagine if you're shooting film, what happens is unless you wanna shoot film, every time you change the lighting, you have to try different things and then try the one, try to go back to the one that you like the most. And that is extremely time consuming. From the top image to the bottom image, we didn't just move the light bank, we moved the reflectors coming in in the foreground. We um, may have added reflectors on the front and rear of the car. We may have tilted the light bank down a little bit. It's a lot of changes that were made that would be way too difficult to try to recreate. But by shooting digitally, we have all the captures are all ready to go. And we were able to come back in and grab the best of each shot because I couldn't get it in one shot. So you can imagine if you look at that fender line, below the fender line is one shot and above the fender line is another. And we were able to blend it very well in the back. Again, this is another car that's not terribly reflective. And I had to put this car in because it's one of the most valuable cars in the world, world and it's stunning. It's absolutely beautiful. It's a Ferrari GTO from 1962. I don't know, can you hear my dogs barking? Okay, good. I can't do anything about it. They're upstairs and they've decided they want to come out of the uh, room I got them locked into. The level of quality and detail that you can achieve is quite extraordinary. And a lot of the vehicles we shoot are very, very historic, extremely valuable. And you won't find a motorcycle more valuable than this. 
This is called the Raleigh Free Vincent. And it was written by Raleigh Free, who is this crazy bugger in his bathing suit. He's riding it to a um, Worldland speed wrecker on the Bonneville Salt Flats. And to make himself more aerodynamic, he took off his clothes and is wearing a bathing suit. And you see he's got little deck shoes there and everything. Um, and if you've ever been to the Bonneville Salt Flats, you don't want to be doing 150 miles an hour in your bathing suit and fall off. Um, you'd leave all of your skin on the salt flats. But here's the car, the bike in the studio. And we were lucky enough to get to photograph it. And although I know absolutely nothing about motorcycles, I really enjoy photographing them. And I normally have people with me who can explain to me what I'm looking at. Because if I don't know the subject matter very well, I need to become intimate with it while we're working. And sometimes the technique uh, that you're using, even though it's an obvious manipulation, can do a very good job of expressing your situation. This is for a book we did called Porsche Unexpected, and it's a collection of Porsches in North Carolina. The car on the left is the 17th Porsche made in 1950, and the car on the right was a very modern car that was, um, I guess, from 2011, 2012, something like that. And what we learned, because we kept the camera still, was we kept the camera in the same place, and because we're shooting on the platform, we marked everything off and tried to get the cars into a similar position as possible. And what we noted was these cars are 60 years apart in age, if not a little more. And yet the car is the same overall height. The headlights are in the same place. The hood badge is in the same place. Everything is pretty much the same between these two cars, except the car on the right is much wider, but everything else is the same. And that, what that does is it tells me that Porsche's design philosophy has remained very constant over the years. And some of these things you wouldn't necessarily know unless you did some of these things. Inside that book, we photographed, uh, I think it was about 50 or 60 different Porsches, but we found uh, with a, uh, 24 different wheels and we reproduce them all in scale to each other on a spread. And in this case, you'll note in the middle of the spread, there's a gap that exists. And that allows for when the book comes together, that none of the wheels lose too much of their uh, shape inside the gutter. As the publisher, I get to control this stuff. And uh, whereas most uh, publishers could care less, and if something was done wrong or something was not in the right place, nobody would care. They would just move on. This is a car we shot for the Simeon Museum collection. And this is the car is different on both sides. And by having the car still set up when we go from one side to the other side, it allows me to match them as accurately as I can. It's very easy for the color to remain inconsistent. Also, this allows me to change the background. I want to see the car in a dark background versus a light background. Or if I want to place a detailed image of the car in the background, this is the actual vellum that was used to uh, create the dashboard in this car. So this is a vellum that they would lay on top of the wood that they would cut out to make the dash. And sometimes our car owners present me with interesting challenges. In this case, the owner said, I like the car, I think in black wheels, but I black tires, but I don't know. Can you shoot it both ways? Now, this would be fairly simple if we were shooting just one angle, but we had to shoot six exterior views. And if 
all we were doing was jacking the car and swapping out the tires and wheels and dropping it back down, you might be able to use the same um, masking work from one file to another. But because we had to rotate the car from every different perspective, we had to come back and try to duplicate the angle in both cases. And because you could never get it close enough, um, we had to cut the car out both times. So it was an extraordinary amount of, extraordinary amount of work, even though the owner uh, didn't understand any of that. And it's important to know that your owners don't have to understand any of this stuff. Most of them don't understand and don't care that they don't understand. But when you have a situation like this, this is a Ford GT40 that raced at Le Mans in 1967, I believe. We can do things like open the car up. We can take the various body panels off and the car doesn't move at all. And it really is a nice way to display the car in a book. Also, because we have such great color control, when you shoot a car from different perspectives and, and uh, sometimes with slightly different lighting, the color of the car can change. And the goal is to keep the color as significant as as uh, similar as possible. So when the book goes to press, the um, printer is not pulling his hair out. Your printer is your best friend. And in this case here, um, FaZe has done a wonderful job with their latest backs and software to allow great reproduction of reds as they go into shadows. This is remarkably clean, this image. And what I like about it, this is uh, in our new book that'll be coming out this summer called Badass. Um, I like the way the top of the image is very clean and simple and graphic. And then underneath is all this ugly, the, all the ugly bits that motivate this car into going extremely fast. I like that contrast. This is one of the Ralph Lauren cars. This is called the Mercedes-Benz SSK Count Trossi. It's a one-of-a-kind car, and nobody knows who built the body or designed it, but it's a spectacular car, and I was lucky enough to get a little ride in the car just before it started raining. And I didn't mind getting wet because the car was so wonderful. Much more recent picture here is this one coming up. And this is the world's fastest Indian. And I saw the car being loaded into a museum. And while they were doing it, I said, you know, I'm going to be coming back here in a few weeks to photograph. Can I photograph this car, uh, this uh, motorcycle? And the guy said, yeah, sure. So this is the bike that was not in the movie. This was the bike that the movie was made about. So they didn't use the actual bike because it's way too valuable and they didn't want to destroy it. And the coolest thing about this bike is when you take the body work off of it, you see this wonderful skeleton inside. It's a quite a remarkable situation. So imagine we shot it with and without the, the body work on it. And lastly, let me show you this one. Um, with the advent of digital capture, with the advent of Capture One, with the improvement of both products, I'm more capable today than I ever have ever been. And I don't, I'm not in a, in a situation where I feel I can't deliver something. I used to get very concerned that I'd see something and I wouldn't be able to deliver it. Whatever the situation was, um, I couldn't deliver. But with phase one and capture one, I can do that. And it allows pictures of these spectacular Ferrari. This is a one of a kind car and we photographed it for the owner. So if anyone has any questions, I think now's the time to get into it. Off the questions. Uh We've been marking throughout the presentation. Okay. I just wanted to say um, thank you. This has been a wonderful presentation and the images brought back a lot of memories from stories that you've told me in the past and um, <laughs> as from the uh, response we've gotten from the crowd. 
in the chat, they've all uh, been enjoying it as well. So um, again, thank you. We're gonna go to the question and answer right now. And um, thanks everyone for hanging in there. First question, Michael. Okay. The Porsche shot makes me want to ask Michael about how he discovers the narrative of the cars he is photographing. Not it's not a technical question, as the as Stephen had mentioned. No, it's a very very important question because my job, if this was a person and I'm doing a portrait of a person, I have to capture. Shall you say that? Shall we say the narrative of that person? We have to find out what that person's about so I can express it in the photograph. That's what Avedon did so wonderfully, Irving Penn did so wonderfully. And um, they did it without any uh, embellishments at all, unlike an Annie Leibovitz who builds a set and has all these strange things going on. So um, I have to find out about the car as much as I can. I do as much research as I can in advance. Uh, we read up on the cars and we speak to the owner about why they have the car. If the book, if the image is being done for a book project we're working on, we will know all of that information because it becomes part of the book. But it's all a very, very important part of what we do and how we do it. Well, that, that's great. Um, that's a great answer, Michael. And that comes to our next question, which you kind of sort of answered in that one, was how much research do you need to do on the vintage cars that you're photographing. I've learned that serious car collectors love people who are knowledgeable. The second part of that uh, comment is extremely, 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 extremely important. When somebody gives me their car and it's worth $50 million, we've never met in person, they're sending it on a car carrier halfway across the country, country for me to photograph, they have to know that uh, I'm going to take care of the car, that I'm respectful of the car, that I understand what the car is all about. I have to know who raced in the car, who designed the car, who owned the car previously. I need to know how long that owner has had the car, what trials and tribulations they've had with it. And that's showing respect to the car and respect to the owner. And I tell every owner that when I do the work, it's completely out of respect to the car, not respect to the owner, because the owner's gonna want me to do something that's probably inappropriate. And, you know, highlight something that is just not important. And I said to the owner, I say, the most important thing on this car, most important thing I can do on this car is be faithful to it. I've got to get the color right. I've got to get the angle right. If it has a flaw in it, we keep the flaw unless the owner says they're getting it fixed right after the shoot, then we'll retouch it out. But that's what we do. And having that kind of a relationship with the car owners is critical. You're only as good as your reputation. And we make sure that our reputation is sterling. Okay, that's great. Next question. So we've got a lot of them here. Um, is, your light, is your light bank custom made and what brand of lights are in there? Um, it's custom made by a company called J Max Robertson, and they are located in Detroit. And this light bank was made for me beginning in 1987. And I still use it today. Yes, this light bank, <laughs> I think is older than you, Lance, and I'm sure it's older than Carson. And, um, but what you do always, 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 always. Buy the best equipment you possibly can. It will serve you very, very well. So the light bank was made in 87 by J. Max Robertson, and that was made through Bron Color because the lighting in there is all Bron Color. And they were under contract to Bron Color to create the bank. And the bank was four sections long, and we quickly learned that the bank wasn't big enough, so we had a fifth section made within a year or two. And the light bank's designed to hold 20 brown color strobe heads. And if you do that, it is way too much lighting and the light doesn't fall off much at all. So instead on the light bank, we use just the front row of 10 
lights and we can turn them on and off. So I can gradate the lighting so it starts light at one end and fades to dark at the other. And because the light is so diffuse, it's a very subtle movement. And you need that movement or things get very, very flat. So um, <clears throat> about seven or eight years ago, we decided to have the light bank remade and we dropped it off in Detroit. And when we did, the person who actually made the bank originally said, I can't believe the condition of this bank. I said, and we'd take it all around the country in a truck. And he said, that's hard to believe how well this has held up. And I, I can't say enough. You have to get the right equipment and you have to know how to use your equipment and have your assistance be very knowledgeable on everything. And also when it comes to lighting, we bring a lot of spares with us. Uh, you don't want to be in the middle of nowhere and find that something's not working. Next there you question. go. Does Michael composite some of his automotive work in, into background scenery? And if so, can you talk about the process? Um, well, some of those photographs that we had up earlier, I don't know if you want to go back to the uh, presentation or not. Um, it is, for example, image okay. 30 and 31. Let me trucks. go back. Okay. There we go. <clears throat> These were put together as two separate images. And the best thing one can do is not necessarily have the skills to do the work to put it together, but to hire the person who has the skills full time, work closely with them, learn as much as you can so the next time you shoot, you can make it a little bit easier for them to put the images together. I do not have the hand skills. I do not have the patience to actually cut this out and put this image together. But I can sit next to my artist, uh, Dave, and I can advise him that I want this a little lighter, this a little darker, and I can give him the thoughts as if I'm taking the picture as a single capture. And um, so it's really quite easy to do. I know, for example, that I'm going to be about 70 or 80 feet away from the truck. I know the lens that I'm going to use. I know the height of the camera on the tripod. So when I go to find the background, I put the camera, at the same lens on the tripod at the appropriate height. I focus to 70 feet away. And if it looks like a, the vehicle can fit in there, it will go together properly. And then we just have to make sure the lighting looks like it makes Great. sense. Great. Thanks, Michael. Okay, next question. Um, are you going to be doing another class presentation at the Simeon at some point, Simeon Museum here in Philadelphia? I hope so soon. We were there shooting over the pandemic because the building was closed. And Dr. Fred Simeon is one of my all-time favorite people, and he's got the world's most wonderful collection of race cars. And he has me in there as often as I can get there to photograph inside the space. So I don't know if it'll be later on this year or not, because right now we're waiting to go to California to shoot a project. And once I get all my assistants uh, vaccinated, then we're off to California. Next question, we're just motoring through these. Um, where are you located, where are you based out of, Michael? Uh, this person sees a lot of your work in California on their website. I'm based in Philadelphia, which oddly enough is where the Simeon Museum is. And I live about 25 miles from my printer. And I didn't say enough about my printer. Uh, it's brilliant graphics. They're in Exton, Pennsylvania. And throughout my career, I've done a lot of work with paper companies um, that are showing off the quality of their commercial paper. So I've worked with the best printers literally all around the world whether they're in Asia, whether they're in Europe, England, the United States, Canada, worked with all the best. And believe it or not, there's a much smaller printer uh, half an hour from my house who's the best I've ever worked with. He is a second generation printer who has um, a degree in photography from RIT, much like I do, and he loves photography. 
but he's knowledgeable enough about printing when his new press arrived, he put it together himself with his press foreman, his shop foreman. He didn't wait for uh, Heidelberg to show up to, to screw it together. That would be like taking your camera apart and putting it together blindfolded. Um, they are so obsessed with doing the best they can. We, if you wanna know about printing, we tend to print on a 400 line hybrid screen, which is extremely high quality. And um, it brings out all the detail that I can give them in the shadows. So I try real hard to give them shadow detail. And then as you go through the book, you see, my God, this book is reproduced beautifully. And I'm still living for the day when I can have all the photographs so properly exposed and presented that he can run his presses on dead neutral and not touch anything. And we're getting closer and closer. Oh, that's to that amazing. Fire. And, you know, I can attest to the quality that um, Bob Tursak up there, brilliant uh, graphics provides. I've been working with him for many years now. In fact, I have a picture back here from 2002 from his first phase back that he had owned back in the day. But um, anyway, yeah, check out their website. I put that in the chat link. And um, here's the next question for you, Michael. Okay, which tools, yes. features unique are unique to the phase one system that you're relying on when shooting on set? Well, it would be inappropriate for me to speak about the uniqueness of anything because I don't use anything else. I'm a bit of a dinosaur in that I'm very uh, loyal to what got me here, whether it's people, whether it's clients, whether it is uh, cameras and software and things like that. Over the years, I've seen way too many people jump from one platform to another. I've never done that. Um, and my understanding of that comes from the great photographers like Cartier-Bresson, who always shot with a Leica with Tri-X film, black and white film. And his pictures were spectacular. I could never achieve that quality, no matter what I did. And that's because he knew the limited number of variables. He knew them well enough that he could control them. So my goal is to understand phase well enough, uh, or capture one rather, well enough, and my phase camera well enough that I can get everything out of that camera. And um, so I don't know what's really unique to phase. What I can tell you from what I have been told is that the color fidelity is exceptional. Uh, the ability to manage color is exceptional. The sharpness is, is as good as there is. And the quality of the files are big enough that even on the smaller captures that we did 15 years ago, when we did the Ralph Lauren exhibition in Boston, we took one of those H20 captures and we blew it up to 40 foot square on the side of the wow, MFA that, that's in Boston. Incredible. And, then... and it, was, it was gorgeous. So the quality is so good. And I know you can go to 16 bit and all that business. We've never done that. There's never been, been a capturing to do in that. 16 bit. And Dave, Dave appreciates that digital Dave. Uh, that's how he gets you those gradients. So, one move and the color. Oh, okay. So, yeah. But there's a number of features, Lance, in the new software, like the ability to do mm -hmm. gradients and masks and healing and things of that nature. That means while the image is still raw, I can make it as good as it can possibly be, such that once I process the file and hand it off to Dave to do whatever he's going to do, he's got the full capability of yep. Photoshop in front of him. And it also means if I'm on location in California or in Italy or someplace like that, I can do some of the work myself and send it off directly to a publication if we're really tight on time. So <clears throat> all I know is, is the wonderful result I get. Um, I hear other people telling me about different softwares, and I, I don't see the point. You know, I never photographed with Fuji film. Mm. I only use Kodak film. I never right. had a reason to change. Uh, too many people think you change everything around and that will get you better to where you need to go. 
where instead what you need to do is understand your equipment and your process as well as you possibly can. And that'll get you where you need to go. And fortunately for me, face keeps improving yeah. the product. Before I can come up with something. I like how I you mentioned in your uh, presentation, how you've taken your older files that were shot with previous generation cameras and used the latest software. And you're, you're finding things in yes. the details or what you're able to do with that file to make it even better. It's like being able to go back and redevelop your negative. It's exactly right. And um, while you can never redevelop a negative, um, you can reprocess a digital capture and it doesn't bother the original. And the way the Capture One software is designed, you can go forward and backward as much as you want. And many years ago, digital capture had a problem with gradients and banding, if anybody knows what that is, in smooth tones. And cars are nothing but smooth tones like the side of that Porsche, for example. And that one image I showed, I liked the image, but I couldn't use it. We went and reprocessed it 10 years later, and the image is wonderful. It makes it, we made a very large print of it. It's got to be a four-foot square print, right. and it's just beautiful. So, so uh, yeah, we got to move along here now. I've got a couple more questions for you. Um, how does Michael or, get the entire car in focus? Do you focus stack at all? <laughs> That's a wonderful question, because when we were shooting film with an 8x10 camera, we would shoot, try to shoot at F32 to 45. We would shoot with strobe, and we would multiple flash the strobes. So if, my, if a single flash would be like F16, I'd have to flash the strobes twice to get to F22. And because the laws of reciprocity failure meant that to get up to F45, instead of being eight flashes, it might be 14 flashes. Now, if you can imagine in that period of time, trucks are driving by the studio, so the floor is shaking. Uh, sometimes we'll lose count of how many flashes there were. And all this was because we couldn't focus accurately. Now, today, we shoot those same cars without any focus stacking, with the phase camera without any camera movements no swings no tilts nothing like that and we're shooting at around f11 and everything is razor sharp the other thing is if you're not familiar with edge diffraction edge diffraction was something that we studied as a theoretical situation in college and we didn't know it until we were shooting digitally and we started opening up the aperture and it's amazing when you take that camera lens and you take it to f5.6 or f8 it is so much sharper than f22 it's not even close and that's because there's so much edge diffraction on some of these lenses so we try to stay in the f11 to f16 range no more than that because we know the image quality will be impaired by edge diffraction and believe it or not Everything is sharp. No, that, that's all. And you can preview it right then and there on your IRES monitor. And yeah. Yeah. And you can check it while you're there. Now, you can do focus stacking, which I thought when I went to do some watches, uh, I would need to do that with watches. And the project we thought we were going to do hasn't come through yet. So yeah. I haven't had the opportunity. Well, once to you do test it stacking. and play around with that some more, it, it's such a cool tool in the way that. Um, Phase one is integrated it into the XF body, makes it really seamless to do the capture side of things. And then capture one's integration to Helicon Focus to put the, um, the, mm -hmm. the stack files together is very seamless. So uh, looking forward to walking you through that when you're ready. All right. <laughs> but not to, dis not to disappoint you, Lance, or anyone else, so rarely do I get to play with focus because so rarely is the, is the entire car not sharp. Right. But I like things out of focus. I like that sense of depth you get from things being sharp or being out of focus. So There's definitely um, a time and place for it. I don't. Yeah, right, I we're going to do two more questions place. here. Everything's going great. Um, what percentage of your automotive shots are on location? Uh, very few. 
I would say well mm -hmm. under 10%. Well, I mean, you shoot in other studios. You know, if you're home base, you have a small yes. regular studio. You don't have a drive-in studio here in, in Philadelphia. Right. I don't have a home studio. Uh, there are, I shoot at the Simeon Museum. I shoot at the Hill uh, Soundstage in New Jersey. But we generally shoot a lot of stuff in California. Uh, we have shot literally all around the world. Uh, we schlepped everything up to Toronto for a big shoot and shot in an airplane hangar. Uh, airplane hangars are good because they have a lot of space and no columns. Um, but one of the real tricks is to have a space big enough to work in so that the surrounding studio and all the other stuff that's there is not reflecting right. back into the car. Okay. And uh, the last question we'll go for is... With those truck photos, do you dress the tires with dirt for realism? Um, that was a while ago. I assume we did. I mean, that. imagine neither of those vehicles were shot on that surface. So one thing we did was we took, like on this uh, cement pumper, we took the color of that dirt that the truck is sitting on and we reflected it up into the... Uh, into the, the yeah. chrome bumper. And what we also did is we put some of that color into the tires. Uh, we will oftentimes put dirt or something in the car or the tire so it looks like the vehicle is there. That's called the flaws of reality. And I learned that from a guy named Bob Greenberg who has R. Greenberg and Associates in New York that do all the really sophisticated um, computer generated graphics like if you see the uh the uh, football games on sunday they come on and the, the lombardi trophy is spinning around and it's got all these things reflected in it they do all that stuff and they've been doing it for years and one thing he was nice enough to tell me he said you've got to put the flaws of reality in and that's what marries these things together so if we were to take that white pumper and put it in the, a studio setting so it's sitting on white a white background, we would have to remove all that color that we put in it. And you wouldn't really appreciate that color until we took the background away and stuck it on a white background. Then you'd see how much work we did to make it look believable. Oh, that's great. Well, um, that's all the time we have today for the questions. If perhaps we didn't get to your question, I will uh, share these with Michael and, and we'll get back to you offline on these. I wanted to thank you for joining us and please stay connected with Digital Transitions by uh, visiting us at www.digitaltransitions.com. And from there you can jump to learn more about our different business units and how we may be able to assist you. Again, thank you, Michael. And- Anytime, Lance, good to see you. And um, please keep an eye on our schedule for some upcoming events. I believe we're doing an artist talk next month uh, with Robert Shreve. Um, and one more thing, Michael, Serge is saying, reach out to him about shooting a 72 t Serge Small. I'd like to own that 72 t <laughs> Exactly. Well, thank you. And uh, looking forward to seeing everyone next time. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Take care.